Um, up next is Mr. Washington. He's going to pass the peas. Let us know what's going on in the community. Please give a round of applause or snaps, all that good stuff. Show some love for Mr. Whoa, John whoa. Washington. Whoa, whoa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so much, so much going on this week. Uh, first, we got to show love to our, our new, newly found ancestor, John Lewis. Um, it's, it's unfortunate, but, you know, after, you know, 60 years of dedicated work, um, you know, I feel like some, some folks, you know, deserve to be in a better place than we are in this moment. Uh, so we have to show respect. And I think um, just want to talk a little bit about, you know, the story of this young brother and, and why we need to really pay attention, not just to who he was in this moment, but to his life and his arc and to how we all need to evolve um, as Black people who want to survive in this, in this white, fragile country that we're in. Um, but, you know, John Lewis started his organizing work at about 15 years old. Um, and he started off, you know, with, with SNCC. Um, and, you know, really built himself up to be a national leader by 18 years old. Um, you know, he, he was in Selma before Dr. King. Um, you know, he was everywhere Dr. King was, you know, um, John Lewis was there first the three years before. And, and they had a lot of beef, you know, and this is something that people do not talk about. You know, um, when, when John Lewis came to, when Martin Luther King came to Selma, John Lewis basically said, you a vulture. You know, I've been putting in work down here for two years, working to build people up, working to build organizations, and you just want to come through with the cameras, uh, you know, and get your victory and go talk to the president. But, you know, where are you going to be after that? You know, so, you know, thinking about being an 18 year old kid um, in 1965, you know what I mean? And at the height of his fame, winning a Nobel Peace Prize, and, and, and you st step up to Martin Luther King and say, yo, bro, you, you're not doing the, your work the right way. You're not actually sticking with your people. You know, and I think that, that he deserves a lot of respect for challenging and helping sharpen Dr. King uh, and the work that he did uh, because a lot of people were scared to challenge him in the movement at the time because he had so much power. So we're talking about this is what he's doing at 18 years old. Um, and then the growth of SNCC. Uh, the growth of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, these national networks organizations. Again, the civil rights movement was not about individual people. They, those were the best spokespeople uh, of masses of people across different cities doing different organizing work. Not very different from what we have going on right now. So, um, you know, just want to respect and clarify, you know, this man's life to, to go from building these institutions, some of which that still exist today, to then saying, I'm going to go into public office. You know, at the time being a communist, being someone who was said explicitly, you know, during the Red Scare when J. Edgar Hoover, um, you know, was killing people, was was outing people's every little bit of personal business, um, you know, at the, at the March on Washington, you know, again, um, 19 years old saying that, you know, I'm, I'm a communist, I believe in the socialist revolution, I believe in the black socialist revolution that's happening uh, all across Africa, um, all across the African diaspora in the Caribbean. So um, I think that, you know, a lot of people want to portray John Lewis just as, as a congressman um, or just show the, the, the picture of him at the bridge, um, but not the story of how his battle with Dr. King actually created that moment in that situation um, that became a snapshot for, for the civil rights movement and, and for, for how we're, we're, we're living today. Um, so please, um, there's a lot of literature. I'll start to drop some in the chat uh, when, when we end this section uh, about him and his personal story and just what we do here, our investment in youth. You know, and, and he talks about the folks at the Highlander Institute, uh, about Miles Horton, uh, about the people who created the political education systems that, that created that. Because John Lewis didn't just start organizing at 15 years old because it was, you know, his instinct. There was a culture of people who were trying to bring up 15 year olds to be revolutionaries, to dream of futures where they could be congressmen and have this legacy. Um, so I just want to bring it back to what we do. You know, there was a group of people uh, at that time who inspired John Lewis, who pushed John Lewis to become that person, that 18 year old who could stand up and check Dr. King uh, and that 80 year old now that we look back as an ancestor and will call to uh, for support when we need it. Um, so, you know, we just want to take a moment to recognize um, not just, you know, the stories that you're going to hear on the news about John Lewis, the respectable stories, but, but to really recognize who he was and, and how we're trying to do the same thing. You know, we hope that that some 15 year old, 14 year old, whatever age comes into one of our sessions and looks at the world a little differently and believes in the future enough 
um, to continue to fight and press against anybody uh, who's in his way, including people who might be considered the greatest leaders of their time. So I um, just want to recognize the energy of, 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 of John Lewis and, and hope that, um, you know, that's what I believe about ancestors, that we carry that with us. You know, once we're aware of that, that we carry that with us and we can call into it when we need it. So um, think about him today. Take, take a little bit of time to do a little Googling, a little research about who he was and what he meant to, to our movement. And then, um, you know, we're in, a, we're in a crazy moment here. Uh, we're in a historical moment and I don't think people really understand the depth of uh, that, that the combination of, of the coronavirus uh, and this kind of nationwide rebellion is, is having on everyone. Um, but, you know, unemployment benefits are scheduled to run out in a few days here. Um, and, and right now, black unemployment across the nation is at 40%, right? And I want people to think about that. If it's officially at 40%, uh, what is the actual number? How many people do you know in your lives who are out of work? Uh, so when we talk about policing and we talk about the apex, you know, these moments like Alfonso Jones, these moments like George Floyd, but what we really need to look at is his, this is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, and now is the time really to think about our brothers and our sisters and how we pool our resources for them, how we do what folks are doing at Feed Buffalo and figure out how to make sure our people are fed, uh, figure out how to make sure our people are housed. Um, the eviction moratorium will be ending on August 20th. Again, we're all putting in work to try to change that, to try to move that back. Uh, but the reality is at some point, the economics of this, this moment are gonna come to a head. And we all know we live in a system of apartheid. You know, this isn't just a racist system. This isn't just, um, you know, a system that's a little bit different for black people than it is for others. I, I wanna be crystal clear, like America is a, a form of apartheid um, and we need to treat it as such and remember uh, what our brother uh, Nelson Mandela did and said around um, how to resist that um, because so much of it is about exposing what's happening, which is what we've been seeing. Uh, but the reality is, you know, this crisis is gonna get worse, especially for us. Um, and I think that, you know, out of crisis, you know, comes opportunity. Uh, I think that there has been a, a, a long conversation about people wrestling with some of the privileges that Black people are allowed to have now compared to, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. Um, people allowed to be in education, allowed to be in corporate America, allowed to be in these spaces without power, uh, but with some of the resources that come with us. And I feel like COVID on uh, this moment has given us a real gut check about the future for Black people and the future uh, of this country. Uh, so we're at 40% unemployment, uh, about 30% of people could not pay their rent in June. Um, and at the same time, uh, there was a few days ago, Jeff Bezos made $13 billion in one day. And I want you to really think about that. We have on one end, 40% black unemployment. On the other end, we've got a person who made $13 billion in one day, has increased his wealth already as the richest person on earth uh, by 25% during this crisis. And so really this crisis is being used as a cover um, to, to make the rich richer and to make the poor poor and to really set a stage for, I believe, a new world. Um, and we've all dealt with depression, we've all dealt with poverty, we've all dealt with these things, but I don't think that we've seen these things on this level really since, since the 80s uh, and the crack epidemic. And so, you know, for us, it's really important to think about you know, how we support people and how we think about what our future is. Uh, and we like to do that in the cool way, in the Afrofuturist way of this future beyond uh, white supremacy, beyond all of these concepts. Um, but just want to call into reality that, that while everybody's working through it and we're all doing what we got to do, um, this is a real historic moment. And while we have historic oppression on one end, we also have some historic victories. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, locally Byron Brown um, and others move more um, on policing issues, not where they, we need them to be, but move more in the past three months than we've seen them move in 16 years. Um, and um, we're seeing, you know, charges dropped against local protesters, uh, Miles Carter, uh, Deanna Davis being freed. Uh, now we need to continue to work to, to get her charges dropped. Uh, but want to say, while there is a future that, that is going to require us to organize and come together, you know, there is hope and there are movements happening and there are people uh, who are building power right now and really changing what's going on. And that's going to have to happen uh, for, for our survival. Um, we also have uh, you know, on a national level, uh, I don't know if folks are really tuned into this, but um, a brother named Jabal, Jamal Bowman 
uh, who've been working with uh, in New York City, recently uh, beat a 16-time incumbent. That's 16 times. This man had been in Congress uh, for 30 years. And, um, you know, personally worked with Jamal, met him, you know what I mean? He's famous for, for canvassing with his, with his Wu-Tang mask on. Um, but this brother was, a, you know, a middle school principal uh, in the Bronx, um, you know, who two years ago said, I'm fed up with this. I'm fed up with watching what's going on in the system. Um, and someone who's, who's definitely thrown down for housing and a lot of the issues that, that I work on um, now is going to represent New York State in Congress. And, and if you think about just the impact that Ilhan Omar um, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, Rashida Talib have had, um, they've become in two years, it was only 2018 that, that they all came into Congress and the impact that they've had. So uh, across the country, we're gonna have um, about 26 new Congress people, uh, which again, isn't the number that we need, but people who are coming in with an energy. Um, I was on a, uh, we did a call with Jamal on Thursday and when we asked him what his vision for the future of the Bronx was, he said, I'm trying to make the Bronx like Wakanda. Um, so that really hit home for me uh, because we have Afrofuturist now who's going to be in Congress uh, and be able to move our agenda. Um, so again, we, we have this, this, this way that you know, COVID is setting up for the rich to get richer and for them to use uh, their systems to make us richer. But we also have a political revolution that's going on um, in the streets that's going on in Congress. Uh, and encourage everyone really to, to really pay attention to what's going on around you because you know what's what's going on underneath the surface today is going to be the news of tomorrow and whether we like politics or not this this is the stuff that defines our lives there's it's going to be a very different world if people get twelve hundred dollar checks next week next month or if people don't get anything uh, when we talk about crime when we talk about domestic violence when we talk about what's going on in our communities um, so I want to encourage folks to to join all the efforts uh, to try to support people especially in this moment um, because we're, we're looking at, at really uh, some great depression uh, type economics here and we all know that when economics get tough that's when you start to see the violence uh, whether it's police violence whether it's in community violence whether it's the violence in our homes that happens when uh, when we can't see the future. Um, so I just want to, you know, really close out by saying that that this this space that we hold, that we try to create around Afrofuturism, is is for us to really get inspired and believe in the possibility of a future beyond all the things that we're dealing with today. Um, that every single leader that has ever uh, fought for for our rights, fought for the the dream that is that what we are today, uh, was an Afrofuturist. Uh, we are ancestors' wildest dreams. Uh, we are slaves' wildest dreams. I mean, you know, Harriet Tubman, um, W.B. Du Bois, Ella Baker, um, Fannie Lou Hammer, all of these people had a dream that we could be doing what we're doing here today, communicating with each other, building space and art. And so, you know, I think that as much as there's oppression out there, we have to live every day as if we have those spirits with us um, and as if we are actually living out those dreams. And then we need to dream bigger, better and bolder and inspire young people to dream uh, because we really don't know the impact that we have, what we can do to someone's day uh, just, by, just by giving them a little taste of that word Afrofuturism and saying, have you have you seen a vision for a future beyond beyond what you see today? Um, so I encourage everybody to get out there and all your interactions and really challenge someone to, to take an honest look at what's going on today, uh, and also to to dream about a future um, that is beyond what we see today, and a future where we're able to be our full selves uh, as artists and working together. Uh, appreciate your time and peace. Yeah, that is Pastor Peas with Mr. John Washington, always dropping knowledge, always just a walking uh, Wikipedia man about the civil rights and our leaders and things of that nature. And uh, we much appreciate it. Guys.